of helical gears. Uh, so similar to spare gears, helical gears are used for transmitting power between two parallel shafts. Uh, one major difference for helical gears is that they're creating an axial load as well. We refer to it as truss load or axial load. Both of them are talking about the same thing. If you're using herringbone gears, which means that putting two helical gears back to back, then we can cancel the truss load, but that's not very common. So we have to deal with the axial load as well. And this comes at a disadvantage, but we remember that the helical gears can carry larger torques and they have a smoother transition of power from one shaft to another shaft. Uh, helical gears, in addition to the pressure angle that we had for spare gears, there are multiple other angles that come into play. One of them is the helix angle. And for spare gears, we had only one circular pitch, but here we have three different circular pitch or diametral pitch, the transverse, normal, and axial. And you have the transverse, we just show it by an index PT. And then you have the normal, that would be times cosine of the helical helix angle. And then you have the axial the circular pitch. I always remember circular and diametral pitch. Circular pitch is a small p and diametral pitch is a large p are related. So if you know one, you can find the other one. So circular pitch times diametral pitch is equal to pi. So if I want to find here, I had pn, pt cosine psi. If I replace pn with pi over diametral pitch, here the same thing. I can get an equation for diametral pitch. So in addition to helix angle, and we have two pressure angles. For a spare gear, remember we had one pressure angle. So we are dealing with one angle. For, for helical gears, we are dealing with three angles. Normal pressure angle, transverse pressure angle, and the helix angle. But the good news is that they're not independent. So we don't need to know all three. If you know two, we can find the other one. So there is a relation between the angles. Cosine psi is equal to tangent Vn over tangent Vt. The other concept that we uh, that is interesting to look at would be the virtual number of teeth when we are talking about the helical gears. So what does that mean? That means the effective number of teeth of helical gears when we compare it to a spare gear. So here we have n, the number of teeth that we have for our helical gears. Here is the helical angles. If you look at the denominator, cosine of any angle would be less than 1. And when that's cubed, so it would be even a smaller number. Uh, that, that means that this n prime would be higher than n. n would be the number of teeth on the helical gear. And n prime would be the virtual number of teeth that we had to use for a spare gear to get the same effect. Uh, so that's, that's very interesting. With a less number of teeth, with a smaller gear, we get the same effect as uh, a much higher and much larger uh, gear. So n is the actual number of teeth and n prime would be the virtual number of teeth. So to better understand this transverse circular pitch, normal circular pitch, and axial circular pitch, it's better to open up just one helical teeth. So if we just unwrap this from uh, around our gear, you get an inclined surface. So that inclined surface has an angle of psi, if this one is psi, then these two angles would be psi as well. So if I want to find Pn as function of Pt, here, I know this is a right triangle, so Pn would be simply Pt cosine psi. So Pt times cosine psi will give me Pn. 
and px so now that i'm 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 looking at the larger triangle here so if i had if this angle is psi if this is px and this is pt if i want to find px would be simply pt divided by tangent of psi so you can think of this triangle when you're trying to remember what are each uh, circular pitch the transverse is just in the transverse direction the axial if you open up and unwrap our helix tooth that's the height of our tooth and that would be the normal uh, circular pitch and this hypotenuse is the actual length of your helical tooth if it is unwrapped. Here are some of the parameters that we have to use. So remember that for spur gears, we had only one diametral pitch and one circular pitch, but for helical gears, we have multiple. So we need to know which one to use for each equation. For example, when you're talking about addendum, you're using the normal diametral pitch, one over Pn. For spare gear, we just said 1 over P because we only had one. The denim similar. For pinion diameter, when we are talking about uh, the diametral pitch equation, this Pn cosine psi, that would be the transfer. So that's NP, PT. So instead of writing PT, here we write Pn cosine psi. Similar thing for the gear. You have the arc tooth thickness, the pinion base diameter. So for base diameter, uh, we multiply by cosine of pressure angle. For a spare gear, for helical gear, that would be the transverse pressure angle because we have two pressure angles here. And here, if you want to find the distance, the distance, it would be still the same. You have your pitch diameters. So add them together divided by two because we need to add the radius of the two. The outside diameter you have the pitch you need to add it to two addendum because you have to add it from both sides and here for the pinion if you want to deden them means the the very bottom circle you have to have the pitch rate diameter minus two of deden them and so forth here let's look at an example a stock helical gear has a normal pressure angle of 20 degrees so that's the normal pressure angle Phi n, a helix angle of 25, the transverse diametral pitch of 6, uh, and it has 18 teeth. We want to find the pitch diameter. So if we have the diametral pitch, and if you have the number of teeth, we can find the pitch di diameter, the transverse normal and the axial pitches, the normal diametral pitch, and the transverse pressure angle. Because we have the two of the angle, we can find the third angle if you remember we said that they are not independent two of the angles two out of three are independent and the other one can be found based on the other two so the diameter would be normal the number of teeth over the transverse uh, diametral pitch or you can write it pn cosine psi if we have the diametral pitch we can find a circular pitch it's just a related by a constant number. And similarly, normal circular pitch, if you have the transfer circular pitch, the axial uh, circular pitch, the normal diametral pitch, and also the transverse pressure angle. We can find it based on the other two angles. Here is the typo. It should be 25 degrees because the helix angle is 25. So here, when we go to force analysis, remember that the helical gears are in 3D. So we have three components. For a spur gear, we only had radial component and tangential component. For axial, for helical gear, we have the axial component as well. Let me go back. Okay. Here is the axial component that is not desirable that's a truss load that we try to minimize or we try to remove but let's look at the angle if this is the force that is acting on the gear this vn the pressure normal pressure angle would be the uh, angle between our force in 3d and also the axial tangential plane 
So this one is between these, between axial tangential plane. So if you want to find the radial component, it would be W sine phi n. And if I want to find the axial or tangential component, I need to find the shadow of this W on the plane, which is this value, this line, and then find the two components. But we are going to talk about the magnitude later. So for the direction, if you're talking about the tangential component, that can be identified by the inspection, depending whether it's rotating clockwise or counterclockwise, is it pushing it to the right or to the left? Usually, if you know the direction, you can find uh, the tangential component. Let's say this gear is rotating counterclockwise and there is another gear on top of this gear, so the reaction force that is acting would be in this direction that is shown. The radial component is always toward the center. So this radial component is always toward the center. But the question is, where, what would be the direction of the axial component? That's very important. You don't find it in Shikli or in other books for some reason. And it's challenging. And we need to know the direction of the axial load because that determines whether our shaft would be in tension or compression and it would change the reaction forces acting on our bearings. So what's the procedure? First, we need to identify what are the gears are. Is a driver or a driven? What are the helix angle is right hand or left hand? And what are the gear is rotating clockwise or counterclockwise? And based on that, we can find the direction of axial load. So let's start here. We identify the driver. So these are helical gears in contact. This is the driver, these two. And then we have to identify whether they're right hand or left hand. Both of these are right hand. So RH, right hand drivers. So we did the first two steps. Now to find the direction of axial load, our four fingers would be in the direction of rotation. So the four fingers would be in the direction of rotation, which is this direction. And then your thumb would indicate the direction of axial load. As you can see here. That's here, the direction of rotation, it changes. So you have to kind of use it, your four fingers in the direction of rotation. I need one more finger and your thumb would indicate the direction of axial load. And this is the direction of axial load on the driver. On the driven gear would be the opposite. So when you have one, you can find the other one. Here would be the opposite on the driven gear. So we find the direction of axial load on the driver and then for the driven gear would be the opposite because it's action and reaction. Tangential components are the same thing they are the same magnitude, opposite direction, radial loads are have the same magnitude and in the opposite acting in the opposite direction, same for axial load, same magnitude acting in the opposite direction. Here we have the driver on the top. If you want to find first we need to identify whether they are right hand or left hand. So if these are the driven gears, these are left hand gears. So I have to use my left hand. Again, these are four fingers and my thumb would indicate the direction of axial load. And that would be the opposite. Uh, if I have to use my left hand again, That's in the direction, my four fingers are in the direction of rotation. My thumb would indicate the direction of the axial load or the truss load. Then would be the opposite for the driven gear. You can find it for the driven, but you need to know you have to flip the sign. However, it works for you. But the direction of axial load is important. It's not something that we can assume and then if you find a negative, we, we know the direction is wrong. We need to know the direction the force is acting on. It's not a reaction force, like bearing reaction force that we can assume a positive direction and find it. You need to clearly understand that. So here is a procedure in, in a text form. Identify the driver, 
identify the helix angle, whether it's right hand or left hand. This, we use it to make sure that we use our right or left hand. Four fingers in direction of rotation. Our thumb would indicate the direction of axial load. If we want to find the direction of the driven gear, we have to just, it's just in the opposite direction because it's action and reaction. We can talk about the bevel and warm gears here now that we are talking about the directions. We, uh, we have separate lectures for bevel and warm gear. The truss load is always away from the point of contact. Here is truss load. The radial load is always towards the center. So this is the direction of radial load. If this is gear two acting on three and this is gear three acting on gear two. And the tangential component can be identified by inspection. For the warm gears, warm gears we have right hand and left hand. So this is the right hand. And we use the same thing. Right hand, use your right hand. And your thumb would indicate the direction of axial load. This direction of axial load is here is important because that would indicate the direction of rotation of the gear. So this is the warm. This is the gear. So if the truss load is to the left here, the, the force, the truss load, which would be the tangential load on the gear would be in the opposite direction. That means that it causes the gear to rotate counterclockwise. And similarly for this gear on the bottom. So here as an exercise, we talked about a lot of directions. Pause the video and find out whether the rack is going to the right or going to the left based on our gearing system. So here, if this one is rotating, uh, looking at the top counterclockwise, this one would be clockwise, and this would be clockwise as well, they're on the same shaft. That's, that would be the direction. And then here is a warm gear, our warm gear is, is, is right hand, so, the direction of axial load on the warm gear would be in this direction. Then the axial load, the reaction to the axial load would be tangential on the gear. So it would be in this direction. And then it pushes the rack to the left. So that's the answer. Here for the warm gear again. This is the direction of axial load if I use right hand rule but the direction that I find this is the axial is acting on the worm if I want to know the direction of the gear that would be the reaction which would be this direction here is the axial load on the worm the axial load on the, the worm would be the tangential load on the gear therefore we found this 